Hi, I'm Roger Moore, and, and I'm just absolutely thrilled to, to be here today with, with Suzanne O'Brien and, and Kelly Woods to tell you about uh, Doula Givers End of Life Certification Training that, that's coming to Seattle. And this, this training's never been offered here in the Northwest and you know, previously, and, and not only will you be able to attend here in Seattle, you're going to be able also to attend live online and by streaming video recording after the training. So Suzanne, please uh, tell us about yourself and, and about Doula Givers End of Life Certification. Sure. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me out to Seattle to do this training for your community and for the world on live stream. So I really appreciate right. that. So let me just tell you a little bit about my background is I'm a registered nurse by trade and I've worked most of my nursing career in hospice care, which is end of life care, and also oncology care, which is cancer care. And it was during those times working with these patients and their families that, you know, I came to the realization very early in that career that end of life was a real challenge for most of us, especially in this country, but now it's even branched off into worldwide communication with others that, that end of life is very challenging for people. And as the go to end of life medical provider, which hospice is, um, we're still falling really short in having those good end of life experiences. So what I did was try to study the patient that occasionally had a really positive end of life with them and their family, because you have to remember that it affects everyone that is in touch with that person. You know, we're losing this, this person and we're gonna remember that forever those last weeks, months, um, we only have one opportunity to get this right. So occasionally I would have the experience of having a really beautiful, almost sacred end of life journey with a patient and their family. And I thought, what are the elements that made that different than most of them that are falling short? And again, adding a hundred times additionally the level of suffering that didn't need to be there. And so two things came about in, in all my findings. Number one was that we're not talking about death. We're not talking about death being a natural part of the life cycle anymore. So why is that? Um, so I had, to, I had to say to myself, because I, I was very privileged, I feel, to grow up in a household that was very open um, from a young age. I knew that we died someday and that it was part of the natural course of things. And that's, that did a great service to me. So I do really um, thank my parents for that. But most people have not. And so in the last 100 years, it turns out that our life expectancy has gone from 46 years old to now it's 79 years old. Think about that. That's almost, you know, that double. And people are so far removed from even seeing the elderly age and especially an end of life process. You know, when we were 100 years ago, people were cared for at home. They died at home. They're actually, their wakes were in home. So it was a very much part of the natural course of things. And now it's this, this kind of secret, this illusion, and this fear component attached to death has become enormously huge. And it's actually the second leading fear. Death is the second leading fear in this country. The first is public speaking, by the way. So everyone usually asks me that. I always like to add that in. Um, and it was palpable, this fear that I was experiencing from families and, and also patients. Um, it, was, it was just interfering with everything I was trying to do for that patient and that family. You know, and I'm talking about even people that were, had lived a full life into their 80s, their 90s. You know, it seemed like when they got a terminal diagnosis, people were shocked, people were surprised. And with that, there was a lack of planning of any sort on any level and that compounded, what do we do? Do we do this treatment? Do we not do this treatment? Um, you know, they didn't talk about what quality of life was for themselves and that's something, again, that's a subjective thing, but it just ran the gamut. And then of course, time is never on our side with end of life. So that person would end up passing and it was just so full of layers and layers of pain on so many different angles um, that this family is carrying with them. And also the patient didn't have the most peaceful passing possible. So studying that we're not discussing death, and, and the good news to all this is that 
you know, this thing called fear that's associated with death, I thought, okay, my early nursing days, there must be absolutely something that is so horrible out there because what the reactions of the families avoiding this end of life process and there, there's nothing. In fact, quite the opposite. I have some beautiful stories that I always share in my trainings about what patients are feeling, what they think is going to happen, even, even experiences that they've had. And it sounds like it's absolutely amazing the whole process. If you are in a place that you can be grounded and open to it and have that exchange with your family of love, of closure, um, and again, being cared for in the home environment, if that's what you like, and being loved on your way out of this world is an extremely important component that we should all be doing for one another. That's really great. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot there. There's been a, there's been a lot. That's awesome. I love what you're doing. And, you know, the thoughts that go through my mind as I'm hearing you describe um, your service, and I assume that... A lot of this will be covered in the training that we're going to be offering in in April is this idea of making conversations and as a registered hypnotherapist a lot of my role is to help people have a conversation with themselves so that they can get clarity and further awareness of what might be restricting or limiting them and you're talking about doing that but also in a systemic way within the family so a doula giver is really working with the entire family is that correct yeah, we work with the patient and the patient's loved ones. And I say loved ones because it's sometimes it's not just the immediate family. It could be, um, you know, a lover or, who, or a best friend that's still in that nucleus that I call that's really affected by this person's ending, end of life process. So, you know, we, it's a heavy load. It's a really heavy load for, for everyone involved and the people doing the care. And that's why it's very interesting because, you know, I have this conversation all the time. Medical schools for doctors, very intense training, they, I think, give about two weeks, if at all, about end of life and death, if at all. Some don't do any. So we're doing a real disservice by not educating the people that are on the forefront of doing the care and you have to remember that sometimes that's the only interaction you have is with your doctor your medical provider and you're looking to them for guidance and support how are they supposed to do that properly if they don't have a background in education it's it's pretty unfair to actually put that on them without giving them and so it runs the gamut with nurses with um, home health aides social workers anyone that has an, an um, opportunity to work with people should have some basic knowledge in this. And this is why this program is so effective because it's a human skill and yet you can adapt it to any area that you work in and even if you're just a person that would like to be there for someone else, very powerful training and, and beautiful. That's great to, to hear that there's sure. such a, a wide potential for the audience. and. You know, I think that one of the things that I've heard um, some of my clients say who are, are dealing with an impending death in their family is they're, they don't know what to say. They don't know, they don't want to say the wrong right. thing. And yeah. so will this training really coach us in that? Yes, I, I thank you so much for bringing that up because that's a big thing. So I have plenty of people that have come up to me in regret and said, I knew someone who got a diagnosis. I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything. I avoided them. And now I feel completely guilty. So that is actually the very beginning of the training. I'll take you on a journey from when somebody gets a terminal diagnosis all the way through to past the point that they die, what to do. And I'll teach you all the skills that will empower you to care for that person in every phase of end of life. Um, it's amazing and we even go into the movement and what's happening now progressively with home wakes and natural burials um, eulogies in first person creating legacy work grieving and bereavement you know forgiveness it goes through just about every aspect that you can imagine and i get letters all the time from people thanking me of how that changed the journey for them and their family this training 
that they would have never had that opportunity for such a beautiful experience were it not from this empowering knowledge. So it's so great to be able to share that with and you all. Because you want everyone it to is, have and that. You, you made a reference to the word legacy, and it is a gift. It's a gift that we're giving the person who is preparing to depart, and it's a gift that we give to the rest of their loved ones. I remember working with a cancer care client who um, did not survive. And during that period of time, it was such an honor to work with this young man. And his mother later told me that they called me the Sherpa because I was helping him on his journey to the summit and relieving him of some of those burdens that made his journey more enjoyable right. so he could really actually enjoy the process. And so I see this training is only going to further enhance my abilities, and I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, thanks for saying that, Kelly. It's it's so right on because it's such a privilege and an honor to be with people at this time. It really is. But what our goal is for them is to help them come to wrap up those unresolved issues, to come to peace with what's going on in their journey so they can have that acceptance. And I'll tell you, when, when we go through that, a really good journey of end of life, the death, the end of life period at that moment is completely different when they have that closure, when they have that um, time that they can actually say what they'd like to say to their family. It, it completely is almost, it's incredibly beautiful. And death used to be revered as a sacred passage. And we've just, and it, there's good news here. <laughs> you know, we've come all the way to where it's backwards right now. We're avoiding it. We're not talking about it but we're on, on the journey to bringing that all back. And again, it's only really been the last hundred years. People sometimes will say to me, this is really wonderful. You've created this. And it's, I giggle because it's not, it's nothing really new. You know, I put it in a comprehensive program and I'm able to pull all my experiences. Yes. From people in the bedside, but people have been dying for thousands of years. And you know, it's only now that we've kind of lost that skill again, but it's beautiful that it's coming back and it's coming back in a very big way which I'm really happy to see. Well, I know that one, of the, one of the things that I really enjoy about being part of the hypnosis community is that it's a community and I can find support and um, access people like Roger if, if I need advice or guidance in, in a certain case. So have you created a community with um, the people that you've trained? Yes. So we have a global community because this is not just we're not the only ones experiencing death. We have people from all over and it was, it was really beautiful. In fact, many of you um, who've read a little bit about how I created this program, it was actually birthed, so to speak, um, on a volunteer trip in Zimbabwe, Africa that I did. So I went over there to volunteer with hospice. And of course, this is a country that does not have a lot of resources as far as medications and a lot of staffing and you know, you know what it's like. Um, but what they were doing is they were going and they were taking a neighbor and training them to sit with the neighbor that was dying and their family like a doula for the duration. And the power of understanding the natural way that our body tends to shut down. And we all do it the same way. So whether you're on a dirt floor in Zimbabwe or you're in a penthouse apartment on Fifth Avenue, that end is exactly the same for all of us, and we all deserve the same education, support, compassion at those moments. And, you know, they taught me to come back and really create something that was empowering as a human skill for families to use, for doulas to use that are not medical. Mm -hmm. And there's something really important about it not being a medical skill is because, and I can speak from wearing my medical hat as a nurse, you know, I didn't get into the nursing profession to do 85% of documentations and not be there with my patients. And it would break my heart every time I left the hospital when I was doing oncology that, and I was there for 15, 16 hours at a time, that I felt I didn't do enough. I didn't do enough. That person needed me in that room more, needed me to just be bear witness to them, to be there to hold them, to be there to listen to them. And being that nurse right now in the world didn't allow me that time. And that's why I became a nurse. So this wonderful non-medical adjunct to the medical profession. And that's the thing. The medical profession is, you know, they're very like, it's very difficult right now. They have a limited time they can spend with patients and there's a high demand 
bring in non-medical professionals and it's a perfect fit. So this, this is a wonderful area because we don't have a time restriction on us. And, and, the med and so there's so many medical people that say, in fact, there was a doctor that was at Sloan Kettering, one of the big hospitals here in New York City. And he said, if you could really do this, we would be so grateful to you. And I thought, how wonderful that he said that because he knows they're sending people home that aren't equipped to have that good positive ending and they're frightened. And that's not fair. That's really not fair to put on people. So, Susanna, doing it together. I'm so happy to hear you talk about bearing witness because I've heard yeah. that over and over from folks that my office is the only safe place where they can come and talk about their death because family members won't allow it and friends won't allow it. They don't, they don't want to yep. deal with that aspect and, and there's no place for them to talk about the fact that they're dying. You know, it, it breaks my heart and also makes me confused a bit because the one thing in life, some people don't even pay their taxes. The one thing in life is that we're all going to have an end of life experience. And if you don't want to put yourself in that position because it's too close, but we are all going to be touched by end of life. We have family members, we have friends, we know of, we know of people. So how that we can say, don't talk about it. Um, and that's where I just feel like we, we just have not talked about it for so long and we've created this fear component to it that if somebody can get out there and share that they have worked in this area and guess what? We don't need to be afraid and you, you know, we should empower and we should have our journey the way we want it. Uh, it kind of just rips the bandaid off in a beautiful way. And, and there is lots of beauty to the journey because when you talk about end of life, you're really talking about life. And people walk away from the trainings with a really new perspective on their journey. It, 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 you know, it is incredible. It, it does a lot of wonderful things. It is. And, and Suzanne, you're going to be here in Seattle, uh, April 20th, yes. 21 and 22 of 2018. And um, again, this is going to be at uh, Seattle Central College here in Seattle. And people can attend live Friday night, all day Saturday and Sunday. Uh, they can attend live online. It'll be uh, broadcast worldwide. And then there'll be the streaming video recordings that people can uh, participate in after the fact. So uh, Kelly and I are just very, very excited and, and thrilled to welcome you to Seattle. Well, thank you so much for having me and I, I can't wait to be there. Really looking forward to it, Suzanne.